Right, so um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, a research problem that uh, has uh, I've been working on quite a lot for the last 15 years or so, and, and that's balancing. And uh, Paul uh, mentioned a little bit about balancing uh, yesterday. I want to tell you a little bit about what I've been doing with this, and I do love crap puns, so this is why I've given this title. I want to tell you what I've done about balancing. But before I do, just my experiences with Nick. Nick, here we go. You you really did have neat handwriting. I was uh, I did all my student time uh, at the University of Manchester, uh, and if it wasn't for Nick, um, the only other person I'd have met in this room would have been Len, who, who is also one of my undergraduates. So uh, you've got Nick to thank or to blame uh, for for me being here today. Anyway, so I encountered Nick a number of times. First of all, he was teaching uh, along with with Len and some of the other of, of the group, uh, the numerical analysis courses, and I was really taken uh, by the numerical analysis uh, as it was presented here. Uh, and this is the sort of thing we were doing then, uh, band matrices. Um, large matrices were n greater than 100 at that, that, at that time, uh, but things have, of course, moved on. I moved on. Uh, having finished my undergraduate degree, I uh, got onto the numerical analysis uh, MSc. Uh, at Manchester, and I was assigned Nick uh, as my project supervisor, and we were working on uh, fast matrix multiplication. I, I I don't have any photos from the 80s and 90s, really. It wasn't something that, that took place, and I, I don't know if Nick's got any photos of me uh, at, at that time, but uh, I do have these things in my drawer still. This was a, a, an email he shared that he'd uh, sent to Steve uh, Vavasis about uh, fast matrix multiplication, and this led on to what I did in my project. And after that, uh, Nick offered me the opportunity to work with him uh, on a PhD, and uh, that was a very fruitful time. These are a couple of the uh, the reports that we wrote and uh, that were published. So we were working on iterative algorithms, stationary iterative algorithms, stationary iterative algorithms, and we moved on to look at uh, matrix multiplication, in particular matrix powers. So I had uh, a great time. Uh, being a student here, I had a great time in Manchester as well. After we saw the acknowledgements yesterday, I thought I would dig out the one uh, from my thesis and and do uh, you see at the end? Um, yep, yeah, Nick was entirely responsible for any good habits I've picked up and entirely uh, blameless for any of the bad habits I've, I picked up. He was infinitely tolerant because uh, around the time I was a student, Manchester was known as Manchester, and I really enjoyed my time as a student uh, in all sorts of, of ways. But uh, thanks to Nick, I, I got a, a, a very good grounding. Uh, you know, some of the, the key messages I got from Nick and from others at Manchester were with a need to balance speed and accuracy. I, I've always thought of orthogonality as your friend. You can use it to uh, in, in so many ways. Communicate clearly. We'll see how well I've picked up that message today. And oh, one thing I did pick up as well, the power method is extremely powerful. You know, it's one of the simplest things to write down, but despite its simplicity, it is at the heart of all sorts of things. Uh, and uh, yeah, here we go. There's the power method, okay? Is in its most uh, simplistic form, of course. Um, if you use this as your iteration in MATLAB, uh, it, it probably won't converge, but you, you can e easily resolve this. But this is it, just uh, five characters in MATLAB, and you've got a really powerful method. So uh, what I want to talk to though is my contribution to mathematics. I've generalized the power method and I've taken this and I've turned it into this, okay? So X equals one, div uh, and so this is dividing component wise the vector A times X, and this is central to balancing. And um, I would claim, you know, th there's all sorts of other ways you can think of it as generalizing some problems you're familiar with. You know, if you think of AX equals B, and AX equals lambda X, two familiar problems. Well, the right-hand side is a function of the vector X. In the first case, it's just a constant. In the second case, it's linear. Here, if we think of this as a fixed point iteration, turn it around, we've got AX is equal to one over X, uh, which is another function of a vector. I think it's interesting. I've never been able to make use of that though. So uh, if anyone uh, can see that, uh, then, then so be it. But let me get on then, and I'll show you where this comes up in matrix balancing. And there are all sorts of 
balancing problems out there, different nomenclature uh, has been used. In this talk, I'm going to look at this final problem where I take a matrix. So generally these Ds and Fs are diagonal matrices and we have a goal in mind. So D and F are diagonal matrices. All the entries on the diagonal are going to be positive. And we're trying to do something to the matrix A by applying a diagonal matrix either side. I'm going to assume that A is non-negative. We might want to use this on other matrices as well. Uh, I might briefly mention the case when A is SPD. You can do some uh, useful um, things in that case. Uh, but if you've got a, a general matrix, you might still want to do this uh, to have some control of the absolute values. And the classic problem in this case, very much related to what uh, Paul was talking about yesterday, is to find diagonal matrices D and F so that all of the rows sums and all of the column sums are equal to one. Here, for now, we'll assume that A is square. Uh, later on, I'll maybe mention rectangular cases as well. So this, in this case, we're trying to make the, uh, the sum of all of the rows, all of the columns equal to one. In that case, if A uh, is a square matrix, then DAF is uh, usually called doubly stochastic, okay? Row sums, column sums, all greater than one. Uh, except uh, I've had um, probabilists uh, object to that because there's nothing to do with probability here. I've just taken a matrix, I've balanced it, where's the uh, stochasticity of that? But, you know, being lazy, I, I will use that term doubly stochastic because it's, it, it's evocative of what we're trying to do. Anyway, I want to talk a little bit about the theory and some of the applications of matrix balancing. First of all, an algorithm. This is the algorithm uh, that Paul talked about it. He called it the Synchron Knop. I call it Synchron Knop because my name's Knight and I'd never thought to call it Knop. Uh, but uh, 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 of course, uh, that, that's, this is an algorithm that he, myself, many other people have discovered. Uh, it, it's, it's got this long history that was briefly mentioned. But essentially, what we're, we're doing is we, we just take a matrix. We first make all the row sums equal by scaling on one side. And then we make all the columns equal by balancing on the other side and iterate uh, until convergence. And one of the things uh, I, I noticed about this, and it, it, it was uh, actually uh, first pointed out in uh, the 1990s, was that this can be done, all of this can be done on the uh, diagonals, the diagonals of D and F. Let's say D is the diagonal. So this operator D, uh, calligraphic D takes a, a vector and turns it into a diagonal matrix. Um, this can all be done on these vectors by this very simple iteration. Um, and so, the, the, yes, Kalantari and Kachian worked on this. Uh, are you familiar with Kachian or you must be, Margaret? Yeah. The Kachian, he was interested in balancing on SPD. He showed there was an equivalence between balancing and linear programming. And I think somewhere along the way, you know, he, he may have found a really inefficient but polynomial method for, yeah, for solving linear programming, according to Kalantari. There's some, it's, there's some interesting history there, but uh, you know, I would have to confer with you. Um, uh, right, okay. So it, they, they were looking at uh, b uh, the equivalent problem for symmetric positive definite matrices. Anyway, it's been, I've, I think I've rediscovered it twice. Actually, I should have known the second time, but I managed to, to rediscover it twice. I, I think that makes me special. Um, but it's, it's been used, you know, the history dates back uh, a long time. In the linear algebra community, Sinkhorn and Not are the names most associated with it. They did a lot of the analysis, uh, as we heard yesterday. They showed when it converged. Uh, it was used a lot in transportation problems. It was used a lot by economists in balancing uh, input outputs for, for various things. But I'll, I'll talk about some other more recent applications. And we heard yesterday, again, that general conditions for its convergence are well known in terms of this idea of total support. We heard about full in decomposability. Let me spend a little bit of time uh, explaining what that is. I'm sure most of the audience know what irreducibility is. If you take a square matrix and you apply a permutation to either side, um, the same permutation or the transpose on the right hand side, and you can form a, a block of zeros, then the matrix is reducible. If you can't, it's irreducible. For full in decomposability, 
we want to avoid that block of zeros, but we can use a different um, permutation on each side. So it's a generalization of irreducibility. You can think of total support as uh, a matrix is you know, sort of block triangular and the diagonal blocks are each fully indecomposable. In that case, you don't get this unique solution because each block could be have a different one. Uh, a rate of convergence, it was, so it was shown to be linear in the early 1990s. Um, lots of interesting work by Sinkhorn, Knopp, and Brualdi in the 60s, revisited many, many times. Uh, and the rate of convergence is bounded above by this quantity here, which is related to uh, the, the relative size of elements. Unfortunately, if one of these elements is zero, then this uh, rate of convergence is horribly pessimistic. It says it won't converge. Uh, and we want to use this in, in many, many cases in sparse matrices. And my first contribution was to it, it come up with a result for this showing what the linear convergence is in, in terms that I understand more readily. And it's a bit like the convergence of the power method. Okay, it's related to the second singular value of the matrix we're converging to, which is doubly stochastic. What's its biggest singular value? Well, its biggest eigenvalue is one because it's stochastic, okay? Its second biggest eigenvalue or singular value it is the key to the rate of convergence, just as the ratio of the two biggest eigenvalues of the original matrix is for the power method. So there are, there are all sorts of connections between these two methods. Um, there are, you know, but if it's linear convergence, it can be slow. And in the case where you have lots and lots of zeros, you can make this ratio uh, very as arbitrarily close to one. So some people have looked for alternative routes. Uh, there's a, a, a lovely approach uh, that Beresford Pilot was uh, involved with. Uh, other approaches by people more from the optimization field who uh, want to come up with, you know, for me as a linear algebraist, knowing it, it, the rate of convergence is, is, is given by the eigenvalues is, is, is fine. For the optimization community, you're talking about com polynomial complexity and, and this is to do with the accuracy of the arithmetic you're using. An order n to the seven algorithm doesn't sound very appealing to any of us, I wouldn't have thought. Um, but as I said, it can be viewed as an optimization problem. Uh, and it can also be involved, uh, it, it thought of as in terms of Newton's method. This again was uh, a contribution by these two Ks. And also, um, yeah, I've started getting into this interested in this problem after I visited uh, Gene uh, in, in the early 2000s, and he was working with a postdoc on related things. And they looked at a Newton's method and used Gauss-Seidel to accelerate it. Um, so briefly, Newton's method, this problem can be recast as a nonlinear equation where we're uh, in the symmetric case. So this is why I, I just involved a vector x earlier. Think of everything as symmetric here. If you've got a non-symmetric matrix, we can just use 0a, a transpose 0 to, to get symmetry. And we can do a couple of steps. This calculus, I, I, I love the uh, what happens when you differentiate these vectors. But you come up with uh, a, a, a Newton's method, which can be expressed like this. Um, and it involves solving a linear system at each step. But these linear systems can be, they're, they're all symmetric positive definite, or semi-definite, it turns out. But they can be solved using um, a few steps of conjugate gradients. So it, it's a, a lovely combination of, of simple things uh, in linear algebra. And we can alter this so we don't just do the, the square doubly stochastic problem. We might want to have prescribed row and column sums. We can do that as well. Uh, and we might want to do some other stuff. But uh, you know, we're using Newton's method against the linear uh, uh, a method with linear convergence. Of course, we're going to be able to do better. We can do arbitrarily better particularly on sparse matrices. This is a cost of the algorithm in terms of uh, matrix vector multiplies in, in certain cases. You want to go 100 times faster, we can rig that up. You want to go 1,000 times faster, we can rig that up. And this is what has uh, led to this method being used quite uh, a lot because for sparse problems, it really does give great performance. Okay, so my first interest was this, was uh, trying to take the idea behind uh, page rank, where we have a stochastic matrix whose eigenvector we're looking for to, to rank things. Here, we take a doubly stochastic matrix, and we don't, of, of course, there, the uh, stationary vector is useless because it's just a vector of ones. It doesn't uh, distinguish between web pages, but we can use the, the scalings 
to, to rank things, uh, but I'll skip through that. Um, speaking to people in machine learning, I, I got to work with uh, Marco Caturi for uh, briefly, which was great fun. He introduced me to the idea of how this can be used in optimal transport uh, solution in, in machine learning. And here we might represent an image as a vector, uh, and we're trying to find the closest image uh, in a, a library to this. So this vector can be thought of as a probability distribution in some way, and we're trying to find the closest probability distribution uh, in the other side. And what we're trying to do is now get arbitrary row and column sums. The matrix in between is, is, is some way of transforming uh, this image problem. And it can be represented as a big optimization problem. They have uh, one left-hand side and a million billion uh, right-hand sides, and they can uh, get through this with, they, they basically use the sync or not method at the moment because it's so easy to paralyze. They're using it, lots of GPUs to do this. So it's, it's a, a nice problem to do. I would love to be able to do this using conjugate gradients on multiple right-hand sides at once, but I've no idea how to get that done. But it, it's, uh, so the, there's a framework in this. You know, you can relate it to this matrix E to the minus lambda M for large M. There they, ha they have a matrix which doesn't have zeros in, but has loads of entries close to, to zero, 10 to the minus 18. So it's a bit like the regularization, I think, that, that Paul was mentioning, but, but this is applied all over the place. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the sparse problem, this is used widely uh, in, in some of these genome uh, data projects where they're trying to remove bias from the data, and they've chosen to use stochastic, uh, doubly stochastic balancing to do that. Um, here's an application, you know, I, I brought politics into it at the start, let's bring it back again, uh, trying to reform the British uh, electoral system from first past the post. Um, all sorts of uh, ways of, of reforming has, has been done, uh, and what we were looking at is trying to have proportional representation while still having these constituencies. All the MPs will tell you that their constituents value having a constituency MP. I've no idea who my constituency MP is, but I'm sure uh, that they're, they're very valuable. But anyway, this is, is the sort of picture. This was 2015. It's changed a bit then. Um, but by proportional assignment is a method that has been brought in in, in a number of places in, in Europe and more widely uh, to, to try and say, well, if we've got a, a constituency with this number of seats and this number of votes, let's try and balance things over all the different constituencies so that it's more proportional. We looked at this problem where each constituency only had one seat. It means that the winner doesn't always come first, uh, but we were able to change the picture of the UK and, and you could choose just how much proportional representation you wanted, okay? Unfortunately, it's a bit too mathematical for anyone uh, to, to, to uh, have adopted so far, but uh, we, we, we live in hope, okay? Uh, we'll see what happens when one of you takes up this vacancy as prime minister, come and see me uh, about this. Anyway, we, we've also used this, um, I'm running out of time, so I'll just mention briefly a couple of other things. Um, we've used it uh, in trying to find block structure in graphs. So I'm sure lots of you have seen the Fiedler vector. Uh, the Fiedler vector can be used as a, a, a the graph Laplacian to divide a network into two pieces using the properties of an eigenvector, using the signs of an eigenvector. If we take a graph and then balance it so it's doubly stochastic, we can then look at the singular values in this case, or, or the eigenvalues if it's an undirected graph. Um, well, the eigenvectors are now, in the idealized case, we don't need to use the signs because they should be um, piecewise constant. And so we can use a single vector and try and find these piecewise, you know, just by sorting it in order and looking for jumps, we can find several communities at once. We can find block structure in, in matrices like this. It, it comes out, uh, and we've used a signal detection uh, or, 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 or you know, signal processing to try and find these, these jumps. And we can find some lovely block structure. As I say, we've got these almost piecewise constant vectors, which you do not get using some of the other spectral approaches. Uh, and we've, uh, yeah, let me skip through that. Um, yeah, we can use it um, matrices with a Perron Frobenius property. These are matrices which have a dominant uh, positive eigenvalue and the eigenvector is all positive as well. The matrix itself, you know, this is generally in the Perron Frobenius theory, this is done for non-negative matrices. The matrix can have negative entries as well. 
we've looked at or, or how big those entries can, can go. We can use uh, doubly stochastic matrices to, to, to start with, uh, checking whether these are correlation matrices, they have the sign pattern we need, but we need more than that uh, can be a little bit tricky. And, and finally, uh, something we've been looking at, we're, we're looking at now at rectangular structures where we can't uh, a priori know exactly what the target should be because the, 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 the uh, block rectangular parts are, are, are different. I just want to say that we've introduced this term uh, for matrices for which A, A transpose E, and A, E is a vector of ones here, and A, A, so A transpose A and A, A transpose E uh, both have row sums equal to one. Okay, so, so if you're doubly stochastic, you'll have this property, but some other uh, matrices do as well. We call these semi doubly stochastic, which is an awful term. And if you can come up with a better one, let me know, because it's, it's nothing to do with probability at all in this stage, because we're using rectangular matrices. And what does it mean to be semi-double something? Who knows? Uh, anyway, on that uh, note, let me uh, finish and thank you all for listening.